All Zelensky had to do was stop attacking the two autonomous republics of the Donbass and it would not have happened. Every conspiracy theory about Ukraine starts somewhere. This one starts with a lack of, um, history education on behalf of Western mass media. I'm Yulia, an independent political journalist, content creator, and most important of all, a concerned Ukrainian citizen. You're listening to FAQU by Svidomi Media, your friendly neighborhood fact check for Russia's special disinformation operation. Today, we'll discuss the real history of the Donbass region, how Russian language ended up prevailing over the area, and what led to the common misconception about the region always having been Russian, solidifying themselves as facts in the Western Hemisphere. But first, let's recap why we're here. The invasion of Ukraine looks like a, a crazy, aggressive move by Russia until you realize that 14,000 people or more, probably much more, were murdered in Donbass and Luhansk because they were Russian and didn't want to be under a completely captured, co-opted, uh, like coup-founded government being controlled by the West, which was and has been since 2014. They hide all of that. You know what? FAQ that narrative. Let's sort it out. In 2014, Western media blew up with reports of a Ukrainian civil war and a nation divided over language, culture, and most of all, national identity. At the center of the conversation stood the coal mining region of Donbass, with its two states, Donetsk and Luhansk, presumably proclaiming independence from Ukraine in favor of Russia. Big-name publications such as New York Times, The Telegraph, The Washington Post, and many more were quick to promote the unconfirmed and, frankly, Russian-tailored tales of Ukrainian Nazis repressing Russian speakers, shelling their homes, and imposing ideology on local residents who deemed themselves and territory they grew up on Russian. Those narratives are largely present in mass media today, despite the many bits and pieces that simply don't add up. If there is this strong identity with Russian culture in Donbass among the people that inhabit it. How come did these so-called newly formed republics, both in 2014 and 2022, are just that, separate republics? Not one big united country, or perhaps a state in Russia? Joining us today is Katarina Zarembo a professor at Kyiv Mohyla Academy and an author of an award-winning book, The Dusk of Ukrainian Sun. She specializes in the ethnocultural composure of Eastern Ukraine and will be helping us dissect why all the common myths about Donbass are simply products of a limited understanding of the region's history. Hello, my name is Katarina Zarembo and I am a researcher of social sciences. I teach at the National University of Kim Hill Academy at the Department of International Relations, and I'm fond of international relations and civil society studies. Let's start here. User at Marisha8330973 on Twitter seems to think that, quote, Telegram has lots of field reports, both sides. You have to look at both sides to stay unbiased. Andrei from Gorlivka has a YouTube channel, is in Donetsk. Check him out. I have a Ukrainian nanny. She says Donbass has always been Russian and wanted to be with Russia. You must be young. End quote. What do you have to say to that? Right, we should maybe start with the term itself, because uh, Donbass stands for the coal basin, Donetsk coal basin. And if we look at the map, of the Donetsk coal basin, then we would say we would see that it encompasses parts of Donetsk uh, and Luhansk oblasts, but also part of Rostov region in Russia and the Propetrysk oblast in Ukraine. So it is horizontally stretched and it does not match the area which has been dubbed as Donbass in current parlance, both of the Ukrainian uh, and uh, English. Uh, so it is not. Uh, it is not translated into uh, Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts if we look at the administrative lines of the oblast. Basically, the problem with this term, according to many Ukrainian intellectuals now, that we, using the term Donbass, we reduce uh, the history and the identity of the region to its 
industrial uh, character, industrial nature, which is very closely bound with the Soviet and the Soviet myth of Donbass, which excluded many other identities, including Ukrainian identity, Ukrainian um, patriotic, nationalist, Ukrainian speaking in terms of language identity, intellectuals and any other professions which did not belong to heavy industry fabrics and plants. Uh, so kind of we would now say white collar jobs, um, women too, uh, let alone children. So many, many identities would be excluded from the myth. And this is why um, if you use it, we should use it with caution and, and with caveats. That said, we have to understand that the, the area has been populated uh, since approximately the Cossack times and basically the these Cossack made the first, had its first settlements uh, in the in the region. So the oldest villages of Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast date back to the uh, Cossack times, so to the uh, uh, 17th to 18th uh, century. So here is the next one. User at Andrew underscore Adonis says that, quote, the Donbass is Russian. They speak, read, and write Russian. It has always been Russian since before the USSR. It will always be Russian. Unless you murder all the Russians. So the cue is, do you want endless war or peace? I'm not a Russia fan, but I do like peace. End quote. Are you not? Huh. Anyways, let's get into it. This is yes, an interesting, complicated story, meaning that they did not appear there uh, from scratch. So these were the people who moved, these are migrants, who appeared in the region uh, because of the Russian imperial and Soviet policies of uh, labor attraction or forced migration. But if we look at, the, for example, the 19th century uh, and the first and only uh, Tsar uh, population census of uh, 1800. 97, and then we would see that the majority of the population would identify them, uh, themselves as Ukrainians and slash Ukrainian speakers because ident national identity was defined in the sense by the language spoken. So over, I would say, up to 70% in the, according to the census defined themselves as the Ukrainian speaker. Then because of the Holodomor, so the, uh, the artificial famine, which uh, uh, was very hard on the Ukrainian agriculture and exterminated Ukrainian agricultural settlements and, and villages in the first place. And because of the industrialization, indeed, um, the region was started to be more populated, so um, uh, uh, residents from Russia also came to the region. However, up to the end of the 20th century, the Ukrainian population was in majority. Uh, regardless whichever criteria we apply to define whose region it was, the statement that it was the Russian region does not stand any you know, any critical approach. So it falls apart, uh, regardless which criteria we take to check. And of course, my favorite argument for the Russian culture. User at Roth Lindbergh on Twitter says that, quote, they wanted to keep their Russian culture, referring to Donbass, language as well as independency. When Ukrainian mobs approached Luhansk and Donetsk to do the same they've done in other places, they said no. It was the people in Donbass who said no, not a few militarized pro-Russian separatists, end quote. Well, firstly, what culture? The vodka drinking? Second, um, what other places? Who did Ukraine invade? Anyways, let's talk about the Russian culture in Ukraine. One of the, uh, of the arguments which I could offer is the ethnographic uh, photographs of the rural culture which we see from this region before Volodymyr. So we would see Ukraine's traditional costumes, we would see Ukraine's traditional uh, settlements in terms of how the, how the houses were made. We also trace this uh, back to the types of settlements. For example, Ukrainians would settle, they would rather have rural settlements and work on earth, whereas the um, Russians who would come for working in the mines uh, would be rather ready to go under, under the earth and work in mine than the Ukrainian settlers. I mean, back in the end of the 19th century, when the uh, industrial nature of the region was being developed uh, by the uh, European settlers, European investors, would call them today, uh, and uh, the Russian Empire. And um, so, as I said, Holodomor and the Soviet history hit uh, the region very hard and uh, exterminated parts of its Ukrainian history and Ukrainian identity. But before 1931, 
you know, you would know that Chekhov, for example, spoke Ukrainian, uh, residing in those areas. But something very important which I would like to say that uh, Ukrainian uh, post Second World War culture, uh, specifically in terms of the uh, writers and in terms of the dissidents, uh, is a pronounced pro Ukrainian. So, uh, you, a big part of Ukrainian dissidents, including those who started the Ukrainian Health and Human Rights Defense Group, uh, hail from the region. So, again, I, I deliberately omit actually using the term Donbass, so from Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast from, from the east, including, for example, uh, Ivan Zuba, a very famous Ukrainian dissident and human rights defender. Uh, Vasil Stus, who is the, the icon of Ukraine's resistance and who was um, uh, killed in, in the prison camp uh, in 1985, so six years before the uh, Soviet Union dis dissolved, was closely tied, tied to the uh, city of uh, Donetsk uh, in his life. He wasn't born there, but he lived a big part of his life there. Uh, Nadia Svetlich, Ivan Svetlich, and many other pronounced names who um, uh, spoke the Ukrainian, you know, were the promoters and ideologists of Ukrainian uh, human rights defense idea and Ukrainian independence idea. So they hailed from, from Ukraine's east. I think this is very illustrative of which intellectual ideas actually come from this region, because if we look for intellectual ideas and culture, then this is this. Like men, like argument. User at Cheburekimen says that classic Ukrainian nationalist argument. If you want to be Russian, then go to Russia. No, because Donbass is historical Russian land. Russians settled it and developed it. It's like telling Africans who live in Africa to go back to Africa, end quote. Let's educate him on history a little bit. So who developed Donbass? If anyone developed the land to its industrial nature, for which the region is famous, this, this is not definitely not Russia, these are Western Europeans like French, German, Welsh, and, uh, and Belgian uh, settlers who came with their big money and um, advanced industry, including their own uh, engineers, and um, uh, started to elaborate the, um, yeah, the industrial potential of the region uh, starting from the second half of the 19th century. And then basically what happened with the First World War and the Bolshevik Revolution, that uh, when Bolsheviks took over the, the Tsar government, the Tsar regime, they just expropriated these companies, dual companies between the Russian Empire and uh, Western Europeans. So basically, they, they told the Western European proprietors, you know, you can be free, they're just ours. The Western Europeans were specifically invited by the Tsarist regime because they could not develop it in the way uh, uh, the, the, the Westerners could. They did not have it, neither intellectual nor engineer capacity, nor money. So, um, so yeah, I mean, this just doesn't, doesn't hold true. And basically, if we look at the history of mining, it goes far beyond mining. It, uh, it also regards many factories, which then had to close down, like, for example, um, glass making factory or rubber making factories, which then had to be closed in the independent in independent Ukraine because they just could not hold together. They were too bankrupt to, to go on operating. So what my point is that various enterprises, various businesses in the Soviet Union, in the region, only held because uh, they worked according to the planned economy. And then in the beginning of independent Ukraine, because of the state do uh, dotation, they called Ukraine, so when state subsidizes uh, uh, unprofitable enterprises. The golden age of the region's industry uh, was when the Western Europeans contributed to it or, or started it. Uh, but in fact, the Soviet regime, uh, if we look at the history of the demise in Soviet regime, then we will see that uh, they would every year produce uh, worse um, results, uh, uh, less efficient, uh, life-threatening. So basically, there was no anti-person-oriented business. Yeah, so if Russians did anything there, they, they just stole and then brought to neglect. That's it. Here is another one. User at Austin says, quote, I can speak anecdotally, having lived in Donetsk 10 plus years ago. I would say the sentiment was 50-50 on whether they wanted to be a part of Russia anyways. I had friends join the separatists, pro-Russian army. I speak Russian because everyone else in eastern Ukraine did, end quote. Did Donetsk want to be Russian? Um, I will start with, with the end, and I would say it is surprising to me that even after the European Court of Human Rights ruled that Russia controlled territory since like May 2014, 
many uh, you know esteemed intellectuals who whose job is to think critically still hold this is some kind of you know uh, Okay, civil war, civil conflict, whatever, and this this idea holds. And I see publications, like books published in two thousand twenty-two, and books, not one book, which you know feature this this title of civil war in Ukraine or something like that. And this is uh, yeah, this is also utterly wrong. Um, so there has never been any kind of movement for separatism. Uh, in you know the Donetsk uh, oblast for you know liberation of Donetsk people or something, and so I'm saying it kind of course or for liberation of uh, Luhansk identity. I mean, this is it sounds even funny, but for some reason it still holds in many circles. So again, if we take any kind of any uh, ground for separatism, be it a separate identity, a separate language, a separate uh, religious affiliation, then you would not find that the region is any different to any other regions, also including industry, because heavy industry is also, for example, typical for Nizhropotrivsk, Oblast, for Kriverich. I mean, you can find all other industries, including mining settlements, also in the Lviv region, for example, uh, or Kharkiv. So um, if, uh, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't hold, hold true, and um, basically that's the point. Whichever critical divergence you try to find in either the next course or the last course, you will not find it. And there has never been any, you know, kind of persecution of the freedom fighters of the oblast, you know, never. Yeah? So this story of People's Republic was completely artificially created. And people uh, without any uh, insignia, so people dressed in civic clothes, who tried to uh, capture uh, the administrative buildings, they did not did not know where these buildings were, and they asked the locals, like, where is the administrative building? How can they find it? They asked for directions. Or, for example, um, another uh, telltale example is when a you know, a strange person in the street started burning the flag of a Shakhtar uh, football club. Uh, and people asked him what he's doing, and he said, I'm burning the flag of uh, uh, Banderas. So uh, it, it, he confused the colors with, with the flag of the symbol, uh, color symbol of the Ukrainian um, resistance army, which is so for Shakhtar, it's bright orange and black, and for uh, UPA, uh, the resistance army, is the uh, red and black. And he confused it. And so, so things you can you cannot know if you're alone. There is many evidence of that, uh, but for some reason, many people especially I would say in the West, just ignore this as kind of, you know, just some human stories and tend to believe the Russian official narrative. Their argument is, they say, but the locals also took part in this resistance. And I say, yeah, but then they are collaborants. They are not uh, rebels, as, as they are often labeled in the press or in, in academic publications. Now, this might seem a little redundant given your answer, but, you know, Russian propaganda is often contradictory. So... A lot of people seem to think that Russian language was oppressed. Is that so? Before the independence, uh, 66% of the uh, residents of Donetsk Oblast considered Ukrainian, the Ukrainian language as their native language. 66 is also an important figure to demonstrate you know, this affinity with, with, with the Ukrainian language. And then to solve and one, those who call this language their native, but it's important to, for also to distinguish between calling the language a native language and speaking it in, you know, in, in the family or work situations. So it was reduced to 41%. Uh, basically, the, this uh, uh, affinity with the language dropped by 25%, and this was already in independence. Uh, so um, uh, according to the latest census already done by, by independent Ukraine in 2001, the uh, proportion of speakers was roughly 90% of Russian speakers. Uh, let's not uh, confuse Russian speakers with Russian uh, nationals. Yeah, but, but, uh, so the region was overwhelmingly populated by Ukrainian uh, citizens, so the holders of Ukrainian passports, who spoke overwhelmingly Russian. And only 10% then spoke Ukrainian, and this 10% was um, rather limited to rural areas, uh, not to the cities. Cities were urbanized and Russified. So no, I mean, this was exactly the opposite. The Russian language flourished in the region, despite the fact that, according to the Ukrainian constitution, Ukraine has only white state language. But schools were taught uh, overwhelmingly in Russian. There were Ukrainian classes and Russian classes in schools, so the parents could choose the language for their children, and this was, you know, the common practice. Actually, the Ukrainian also, Ukrainian-speaking places or spaces were super limited to very specific areas where people either chose it to do, to do it on purposely, 
literature clubs, reading clubs, speaking clubs, or you know, universities and uh, uh, various intellectual media. But overall, I would say that the Russian language enjoyed every kind of support and priority. And uh, I cannot remember a single instance of the fact when Russian would be oppressed in Donetsk or Luhansk Oblast. My hypothesis is that this was because of the uh, uh, local uh, authorities, local uh, uh, government. Uh, of, so in the 90s, quite quickly, it started being transformed to the, uh, what was then called the party of the regions, but the people were roughly the same. So this kind of criminal oligarchic clique, which was also overwhelming the Russian and the support for the Russian language on their behalf was immense. Meanwhile, we can see that the, you know, Ukraine, independent Ukraine was stuck in the regional power struggle. So they were released from the Tripsk, uh, they were elites from Donetsk. They were basically not as pronounced uh, oligarchic elites from the Western regions because this is the structure of the Ukrainian economy, the big business is not concentrated in the West. I would say that in terms of, of the language and culture, um, Ukraine had a high degree of decentralization back then in the in the bad meaning of this term. So basically, Kiev did not do anything to kind of enforce or, or punish the non-observance of, of the constitution in terms of language. And then also we have to admit that the uh, law, for example, on the using uh, obligatory using of Ukrainian public spaces uh, in an in service only came years later. Uh, so I would say we also lack some legal in instruments. So I attribute it to the to the regional authorities who had um, I would say a local, a provincial, and partially pro-Russian agenda, uh, but not pro-Ukrainian one. How about this one? User at money underscore Mitch seven 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 wrote that quote with welcome arms. We seen this with the people of Donetsk, Mariupol, Crimea. Damn near everywhere the Russians purged Nazis and gave safety to Ukrainians. End quote. Can we talk about this? Support for free, uh, free Ukraine, free independent Ukraine uh, was in Donetsk and Luhansk uh, regions higher than for the revolution of dignity, despite the fact that you have to underline that the protests for the European choice, human rights and dignity also took place in many cities in, in Donetsk Oblast and in Luhansk Oblast. But the uh, thousand strong uh, demonstrations only started in uh, Donetsk uh, in March 2014, when people already felt that something is going wrong, that this, this people, you know, strange people without insignia are threatening their, their city and their region, and um, this was also when the first uh, uh, victims fell dead from, from the hands of you know, unknown black-dressed people. The name of the local activist who was one of the first uh, to be killed was Mutra Chernyavsky, and then there was uh, 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 the, the Rybak, the local Khodlivka deputy, uh, Vladimir Rybak, uh, and other people. People definitely protested, and while several thousand strong demonstrations may not seem as a big number for a city like uh, Donetsk, which was a multi-million city, uh, the, uh, so the multi over one million city, then we have to also know that this tradition of mass protesting was not typical for Ukraine's East, also for many reasons. So we would, I would suggest that we compare Donetsk to Donetsk rather than to Kiev. And so we have to see that there was public protest for once. Uh, secondly, what is also important to, to understand that uh, Ukraine uh, in 2014, in, in March, in April, in, in May too, uh, was in a kind of power vacuum when Ukraine's security services were subjected to FSB based on, on a legal agreement between uh, SBU and FSB in 2012, when Ukraine had a 6,000 strong army. Just listen to this figure, 6,000 strong army. Now Ukraine has up to 1 million strong army. Then we had 6,000 deployable troops. And I think this is very important to underline that uh, you know, security-wise, so defense-wise, Ukraine was rather weak. I would assume uh, that, that this was a deliberate step by Russia to attack when Ukraine was weak. And we also have to remember uh, that the front line moved 
in 2014 and also moved in favor in, of Ukraine. So Slovyansk was occupied and liberated. Mariupol was occupied and liberated. Uh, and this was the case for other for other cities. And this was done with the help of not only Ukrainian regular army, but also the volunteer battalions, uh, who were basically comprised of these, you know, fighters who were just willing to go and fight, regardless of whether they are formally registered with the army or not. Ukraine was criticized by, by the West for that, but in fact, this was the only way to ensure security. So if we look at this independent uh, battalion, volunteer battalions. Do we see people from Donetsk and Lugansk always there too? So again, when we speak about resistance, what do you want to see when you want to see resistance? Yuri Matoschak, one of the key leaders of Ukrainian movements in, in Donetsk, was um, uh, killed in action in Ilovaisk in uh, August 2014. Uh, he was from Donetsk, Donetsk local, yeah, born in Donetsk. For some reason, I can see that such examples are overlooked by many. That's all, uh, kind of anecdotal evidence from my experience, but I see that some people or the many people from the region who did not for any reason joined army in 2014 and again i can give more examples of those who did but those who did and they did so in 2022 uh, and i see this i have various examples of, of this kind of you know like defense with the second company because the ukrainian military calls it the second company the first one in 2014 because you did not uh, run away if, if they you know left the, the region as idps intentionally displaced persons you do not run away the second time so this was about so Yidus Magila, for example, who is a very famous Ukrainian paramedic, the representative of Ukrainian Muslims, who now uh, uh, fights in Ukraine's East. And, and, other, uh, uh, and there are many other examples of that. So was there resistance? Of course there was resistance. But I would say that uh, this story was not media communicated well enough. And once it wasn't, it is hard to kind of, you know, rewrite this story in retrospect. Ah, uh, and we arrived at my favorite argument, the Azov Nazis. User at that day in 1992 says that the UN demands that Russia leave Ukraine. But where was the UN when the US illegally cooed Ukraine in 2014? Did the UN stop the eight plus years of bombing of ethnic Russians in Donbass by the US backed Azov Nazis? End quote. Here we are at Azov and the bombing of Bombas. Yeah, uh, Bandera Nazis from Azov is actually is actually another interesting case. I mean, I'm not a, um, an expert in kind of Azov movement and Azov battalion, but it is also um, very you know interesting to me as a researcher to see that Azov was a Mariupol-based battalion. Uh, is said to have one of the best uh, military training bases in Ukraine among the all units. And I think that when we speak about Azov. And again, especially when people can't quite locate Mariupol on the map, I fortunately had this experience in, in TV shows when, in, in the Western countries, yeah, when they kind of confused, for example, Azov and Plexi. Yeah? Uh, so people do not realize that these are, or uh, no, okay, not, not all of them, but uh, the big part of Azov Battalion were the locals, the local people living in the Nesk region. And it's kind of, you know, Azov is something different from Donbass. Yeah, okay, it is different. It does not belong to the Donbass for Soviet means. With Azov and, and with Berdyansk, you see, it is also the case for me when I go in my book, the people from the east and the south would stand up and speak as if they were also from, from the east because they would share similar stories. And this is exactly because these Russian-speaking regions, Russian-speaking, not also, you know, not historic, so uh, not vol voluntary, but as a part of imperialist policies of Russia on Ukraine's territory. So they know that they are being, so that Russia attempts to instrumentalize these regions, you know, to establish Kharkiv People's Republic, Zaporizhia uh, uh, People's Republic, Odessa People's Republic, as a part of Novorossi project, which again I think many people overlook, but it's dating back to 2014. And they speak and say, come on, I mean, we are, we are Ukrainians, we want to we support independent Ukraine, we don't want to be part of Russia. Also, have you noticed how the people who usually spread these narratives about bombing of Ukrainian cities by Ukrainian Azov Nazis usually can't even spell these cities? What? The... the atrocities yeah of uh, some people who, who attack donbass they usually as you just said i think this is an important thing they misspell donbass that's one thing and they seriously misspell so it's a systemic misspelling meaning they do not know what it is they call uh, donbass a city so again they don't know it's a region what this tells us that this topic is only discussed by those who are not from donbass because even if donbass is itself contested in ukraine proper so for example you mentioned the region preazovia if you go to mariupol and you ask okay so how do you live here in donbass they would say we don't live in donbass we live in preazovia so this is a separate natural territory it has its own name 
like Podnyprovia or Vodilia or other uh, Ukraine's compositions. Uh, so this is uh, this is a propaganda piece which is created for those who actually don't know what Donbass is, and among those people it takes, but among others it doesn't. You see, the, the question with propaganda is that one, once you start disproving it, you, you have to engage with these arguments. And the point is that it just lies with, with which you maybe don't have to engage with. The front line of 2014, 2015, which was moving into uh, moving and then frozen according to the so-called Minsk agreements, froze while there have not been neither registered nor reported uh, bombings of the cities uh, coming from Ukraine's side. And this can be checked with any, uh, you know, UN report, we should check on that time. Um, but maybe I should start, with, I should again repeat the point with which, which I started, that, that, yeah, I mean, the fact that this frequent misspells and misdescriptions of Donbass pinpoints the artificiality of the claim and the poor awareness of what it actually stands for by those who distribute it. And lastly, my favorite runner-up narrative. User at Intel Arrow suggests that, quote, Ukraine has violated Minsk agreements by recapturing territory occupied by Russia since 2014. Can we get Merkel on the phone? End quote. I find it quite entertaining that those who bring up Minsk agreements don't even realize that there were 13 points in them and Russia violated most of them. But let's start with the basics. So the first point of Minsk agreements was the ceasefire. The ceasefire uh, didn't hold. That's it. Minsk agreements were never held. That's it. Minsk agreement was indeed. Maybe we, indeed we should define what Minsk agreement was. So this was the agreement which tried to find a settlement uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine. And uh, as you said, yes, uh, Russia never held its uh, its points, uh, which had to include the ceasefire. The Russian troops should have left uh, the region and the uh, demilitarization. It never held, and it's also important to remember that there was an attempt uh, to create three very small uh, areas in which Minsk agreements had to be implemented as a kind of you know, pilot, pilot areas for implementation. And even those three little areas did not hold. Um, so yes, people who say that Ukraine violated Minsk agreements just don't know probably what it was about. And that'll be it from our guest today. If you'd like to read her book, Unfortunately, you will have to know Ukrainian, but if you do, I left the link to it in the description below. Otherwise, she's hoping to translate it to multiple languages as soon as possible. Stay tuned! Join me on the next episode as we continue to bring facts to the battlefield of Russia's special disinformation operation. And in the meanwhile, if you'd like to be filled in daily on everything that happens in Ukraine, as well as hear some sassy responses to Russian trolls, don't forget to follow me on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram at Y-E-W-L-E-E-A and extend that same courtesy to Svidomi Media, also linked in the description of the podcast. Well, don't miss me too much. I'll see you next week and FAQ you, Russia, and your special disinformation operation.